Hi everyone, I'm Dan Fullerton, and in this lesson we're going to talk about angular momentum. Our objectives include calculating the angular momentum of a point particle and utilizing conservation of angular momentum to analyze the behavior of rotating rigid bodies. So let's start by talking about what angular momentum is and comparing it to linear momentum. Linear momentum was the product of an object's inertial mass and linear velocity, and we talked about how that's conserved in a closed system. If you remember, P, linear momentum, equals inertial mass, M, times velocity. And really, it describes how difficult it is to stop a moving object. Angular momentum, capital L, also a vector, is the product of an object's moment of inertia and its angular velocity, about the center of mass. It's also conserved in a closed system when you have no net external torques applied. Angular momentum is equal to moment of inertia times angular velocity. And look how this compares to our formula for linear momentum. Angular momentum, linear momentum. Rotational inertia, mass. Angular velocity, translational velocity. You're really just looking at the rotational side of the same basic concept. So, if we want to calculate angular momentum, let's assume that we have some mass m with velocity v moving at some position r about point q and it's traveling in this direction. Well, in, when we're talking about angular momentum, it's going to depend upon the point you're measuring it from some point of reference, which is going to be our point Q. So we'll denote this as angular momentum L about point Q is equal to the position vector R crossed with the momentum vector, which is M times the velocity vector, MV. In order to get its direction, we're going to use the right hand rule again. Point the fingers of your right hand in the direction of the position vector from your reference point to the particle and then bend them in the direction of the object's momentum vector. Your thumb will point in the direction of positive angular momentum. It's a cross product. In order to find its magnitude, well that's just going to be mvr times the sine of the angle theta. And we can also calculate it as moment of inertia times angular velocity. And what I'd like to do is take just a second to show you how we go from this formula to that formula. And we'll take a simple example of an object moving in a circle, a circular path, about some point in the center C, at a radius R, with velocity V at that given point. Well, we know the magnitude of the angular momentum about point C will be MVR sine theta, but in this case, because it's moving in a circle, anywhere around the circle, that angle theta is always going to be 90 degrees. So sine 90 degrees will be 1, so that's just going to be MVR. But we also know, as we talk about angular velocity compared to translational velocity, that V is equal to omega R. So I could rewrite this as LC equals mr squared omega. But if you remember, mr squared, that's moment of inertia. So we could write this as lc equals moment of inertia mr squared times angular velocity. That's how we get to that formula, for a simple case at least. The direction again of the angular momentum is given by the right hand rule. In this case, if we point the fingers of our right hand in the direction of the position vector, two point m, and then bend the fingers of our right hand in the direction of the momentum vector, I'm going to find that my thumb points into the page. So that's the direction of the angular momentum about point q, into the plane of the page. Finally, the total angular momentum of a system is the sum of the individual angular momenta of all of the particles of that system. So, let's take a look at a sample problem where we're calculating some angular momenta. Let's find the angular momentum for a 5 kilogram point particle over here in red, located at 2 comma 2, with a velocity of 2 meters per second to the east. Well, I'm going to start with the moment of inertia about point O, pardon me, the angular momentum about point O, and I want the magnitude is going to be mvr sine theta, where our mass is 5 kilograms, our velocity is 2 meters per second east, 
our distance, our radius, the position vector's magnitude from 0 to 2 comma 2, well, I can use the Pythagorean theorem to find out that that's just going to be 2 square root of 2. And the sine of our angle, well, that angle is going to be 45 degrees, square root of 2 over 2, which gives me 20 kilogram meters squared per second. Now to show how we could also get the moment, the uh, angular momentum about point P, which is at two comma zero over here, we'll find the magnitude of the angular momentum about point P, again equal to MVR sine theta, where M is five, V is two, R now from P to that point is just two units, two meters, and our angle now is going to be 90 degrees. So 5 times 2 is 10 times 2 is 20. So again, we have an angular momentum about point P of 20 kilogram meters squared per second. Finally, let's find the angular momentum about point Q over here. Well, as I do that, the angular momentum about point Q, and let's find its magnitude, is MVR sine theta. So our position vector and our velocity vector are in the same direction, which means our angle here is going to be zero degrees. So the sine of zero is zero, which means our angular momentum about point Q is just going to be zero. So you can see angular momentum depends upon your reference point. Different values for Q, comp Q compared to O and P. Let's take a look at a conservation of angular momentum sort of problem. Here we have a Lincoln spinning on a rotating pedestal, a penny, with an angular velocity of eight radians per second. Vice President Andrew Johnson throws him an exercise ball, which increases his moment of inertia from two kilogram meters squared to 2.5 kilogram meters squared. What is Abe's angular velocity after he catches that exercise ball? And we're going to neglect any external torque due to the ball. Well, I'm going to use conservation of angular momentum because we don't have any next external torques. I can say the initial angular momentum must equal the final angular momentum. And the initial angular momentum is going to be the initial moment of inertia times the initial angular velocity. That must equal the final moment of inertia times the final angular velocity. Our initial moment of inertia is two kilogram meters squared and angular velocity eight radians per second, that must equal the final moment of inertia, 2.5 kilogram meters squared, times the final angular velocity. So I can then solve for final angular velocity, that must be two times eight, 16 divided by 2.5, or about 6.4 radians per second. So as his moment of inertia goes up, his angular velocity as he spins on that penny goes down. Let's take a look at another example here. A disc with moment of inertia one kilogram meter squared spins about an axle through its center of mass with an angular velocity of 10 radians per second. An identical disc, which is not rotating, is slid along the axle over here to the left until it makes contact with the first disc. If the two discs stick together, what is their combined angular velocity? Initial angular momentum must equal final angular momentum because we don't have any net external torques. So I'm going to write the initial moment of inertia as I0 times omega0, just to maintain consistency with our diagram over here, equals final moment of inertia times final angular velocity. And if I solve for final angular velocity, that's just going to be I0 omega0 over IF which implies then that final angular velocity is going to be equal to one kilogram meter squared times 10 radians per second divided by two kilogram meters squared. Moment of inertia is gonna double if we had an identical disc. So that's just going to be five radians per second. The angular velocity gets cut in half. All right, let's take a look at angular momentum in heavenly bodies briefly. We're going to develop a relationship for the velocity and radius of a planet in an elliptical orbit at any point in that orbit. So assuming S is the object we're orbiting about, 
we could take a look and say, you know, at some point over here, this mass that's in orbit has a position vector. Let's call that r1. At that point, it has a velocity vector, v1. There's our angle theta1. And as we look at that, there aren't any net external torques here. So we know angular momentum has to be conserved. Let's take a look also at another point here in the object's rotation. Let's call that r2 over here where it has velocity v2 and angle theta2. Well, by conservation of angular momentum, we know that L1, angular momentum at point 1, which is m1 v1 r1 sine theta1, must be equal to L2, which is m2 v2 r2 sine theta2. And with just a little bit of analysis, the mass isn't going to change here. So the mass can be divided out, and we find that we have v1 r1 sine theta1 must equal v2 r2 sine theta2, a relationship between the velocity and position at any point in the object's orbit. Now we could also look at some specific points here. Let's take a look over here at what's known at apogee. We'll call that point A, where the object has some velocity here, VA. Its position vector is RA, and the angle here must be 90 degrees. And we'll compare that to the point over on this side, known as perigee, capital P. Velocity that direction, radius RP, velocity VP. Well, when we're at apogee and perigee, well, in that case, this equation still holds, but now we have VA, RA, sine theta A, which is 90 degrees, must equal VP, RP, sine theta P, which is 90 degrees. Sine 90 is 1. That's going to divide out of both sides the same thing. And we find out that the velocity at A times the distance from S at point A equals VP, RP. So now we've got an even simpler equation that relates the velocity and position at apogee and perigee for our object in orbit. And if you look at this very closely, this should look extremely familiar to Kepler's second law for planetary motion. That's where Kepler's second law comes from, that equal areas and equal times. Talking about how it has to go faster as you're at smaller distances from the object you're orbiting around. So great opportunity to go back and review orbits and Kepler's laws right here. All right, hopefully that gets you a good start on angular momentum and conservation of angular momentum. If you need more help or looking for more information, check out aplusphysics.com. Thanks, everyone. Make it a great day.